was reminded of how different it is to be in a space where being understood is the assumption. How much energy am I wasting in my life and in my work? Working from and coming from this place of like, how do I make myself clear? Who gives a fuck? Like if, I, if, if I'm if i not understood, then I'm not understood. Then it's not for you. What a waste of energy. So now I wonder what will I have energy for when I come into it with almost like a mantra. If I use this mantra of like, I am understood, I have sat with this, and love. Because love. What gets made? What gets created? And how do you feel as you're doing it? If those are your inherent assumptions, those are your jumping off point, not the place you're trying to land. What if instead of doing work in the hopes of landing in the space of now I'm understood or my work, it will speak to me and I will hear it when it's good enough to be heard or now I achieve love. Now I can love it. Now I can love myself because this thing is made. And what if you start there? You're already understood. You've already sat and listened to what the work is telling you. And love is already abundantly present. Help Me See is a podcast dedicated to the art of seeing. It's a space for the restless visionary with an insatiable desire to create the life and work you're meant for. My name is Bianca Leah Mora, and I'm a photographic artist, a mother, and a coach who's transformed my fear of loss into power, art, and philosophy. One of the scariest quotes I never want to say is, I wish I knew at the time. But I truly believe that we have the innate ability to bring our wise 2020 hindsight to our now. You can deeply experience your nostalgia now while it's actually happening with no regrets. All you have to do is see. In this show, we laugh, we cry, we get inspired, we overshare. (laughs) We have life-changing conversations around making meaning, self-discovery, and shedding all of the BS layers in order to reconnect to our own sacred vision. Seeing yourself is an essential key to living powerfully. You are the vessel the lens that filters absolutely everything in your life. What are you filtering for? Whether it be conversations with fellow artists and visionaries or my solo audio journal style introspective ramblings, each episode is meant to feel like an exhale, an unraveling of truth, a moment for you to be able to put your finger on something that you haven't been able to for far too long. Come exactly as you are. It's perfect. Honor your instincts. Let's uncover some of the most important things in our lives, which all too often can slip out from our view. Let's commit to seeing and consciously creating what only you can in your one and only life. Let's dive in. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Help Me See. Uh, Today I'm coming to you with some half-baked intentions around what I want to share. So I really want to talk about my workshop that I went to this past weekend. Uh, This past weekend? Yeah, I guess it's been a week since I've been back. Maybe a little longer. I feel like I haven't been able to process it. (laughs) And perhaps I can process it here live with you. Um... My partner, he's like, I'm kind of worried about you. Like, it's you're just kind of weird about it. Like, you know, I'm not saying much. And I don't, and I'm like, yeah, because I don't know what, (laughs) I don't know what to say. Um, And I was listening to something the other day and they reiterated the quote that, and I remember how strongly I um, don't, not disagree, but, contend with it, Um, share from the scar, not from the wound. 
Uh, and I just don't like that. I totally understand it. I respect it. And I like for what, for the, for when people identify with that. And, um, you know, I don't believe in pushing to share when you're not ready to share or, you know, I, I believe it from that aspect. But what I don't like about it is the, um, the, you know, the inherent shame that can be cast the other way around. Um, if you're sharing before you've healed or before you've quote unquote figured it out and put it in perspective and like, you know, compartmentalized and I don't know, not that that's what it means. Like, I, I really don't like this idea of like showing support for one school of thought inherently means you object or you don't support another. Like, I don't believe that, but I just want, I feel the need to highlight how important it is to freely share if you feel comfortable to do that. And if that's something you crave, um, I think it's, important for someone to get um, just insight into what it looks like to hear someone thinking something through um, that is not all figured out already. That is not something that is completely healed. Um, Because I think that if everyone in the whole world only shared from a place of being completely healed or figured it out or from a place that's not so raw, then it's very isolating for us in our moments when we are just desperate to have seen something that feels anything like the way we feel now in this raw moment, right? I think about that beautiful blurb from uh, Ethan Hawke where he talks about, um, I've shared it like a million times now on Instagram, how you know, people go about their lives not really caring about poetry or art sometimes. And until they experience something or like losing someone or falling in love and like they just are desperate to know and under- if anyone else has felt anywhere near like they feel. If there's something that they can encounter that makes them feel like seen or reflected or, um, you know, not on a com- in a completely different galaxy um with their pain or their joy and um so yeah i you know it's not that i feel like oh the way i process can is so helpful for others because i do it so elegantly not at all not at all but i do feel like you know ever since i had my kind of whiplash moment with postpartum anxiety and depression and Knowing that I have some level of comfort um, and okayness in just being transparent and like, whatever, it is what it is. This is my truth. This is honest. Um, My intentions are pure, so take it or leave it. Uh, And I don't feel like it's a a painful thing for me to do to share. Um, That's why I kind of feel this now uh, pull, this draw to just, oh, I don't really know what to say. So let me hit record while I'm meandering around what the fuck to say. <laughs> so here I am. Hello. And if you've been listening for a while, dear friend, you know that well. <laughs> so, okay. Let me start from a little bit of the beginning as I take a sip of my iced coffee. All right. I applied for this workshop from a photographer um, that I've been following since 2009, I think. His name is Alex Soth. And this photographer means a lot to me because when I discovered his work, it's not just that, oh, I liked his pictures and his pictures are beautiful and powerful or his style or whatever. It's that when I discovered his work and learned about how he did his work, I discovered a new way of life that's possible for me as a photographer, as an artist. The way he immerses himself in his long-term projects is something that 
I mean, I'm, I had surely heard of before in some way, shape, or form, but we all know we could hear something a million times and it never lands until it lands. And there was something about him and his work and his story that just landed with me. And um, he gave me so much hope and excitement and enthusiasm and inspiration for a living life led by this, by this passion. And um, so Sleeping by the Mississippi was the project. And and the whole thing about it was that he got in his car and he drove along the Mississippi and he, you know, in encountered people and he, you know, researched and found, um, you know, businesses or places or spaces that he thought might be interesting. And he made pictures and with strangers and just this completely immersive situation. And until then, I think I thought of photography as like in terms of like sessions like knowing it could be projects, like a bigger thing, but like, okay, on this day I go and I do this and I take these pictures and I, I never really thought about it like, like the way he had done it. And, um, so speeding back up, um, when I saw that he was hosting an intimate workshop in his home, I was like, what the fuck? That's amazing. What is he doing? <laughs> That's crazy and also wonderful. And I cannot even believe it. And um, I had felt kind of jaded from applying to a lot of, you know, open calls or this and that and not getting selected and, you know, having spent, you know, admission fees or uh, just a lot of time. And I just kind of felt like so over applying for things. And I saw that and I really wanted to apply for it. And I don't know, whatever with the kid, life was just busy and I didn't. And then he came on uh, Instagram and he said, uh, you know, that they were blown away by how many submissions they got from like all over the world. And he was going to do one more uh, this year. And I was like, oh, fuck. I just when he said, and I'm going to do one more, I felt like I need to. But then I was like trying to talk myself out of it. I talked to my partner and my partner's like, you need to apply, just fucking apply to that. I'm like, ugh, okay, I will. So I was in San Francisco on work. It was one of the weekend days that I had time. So that was like the whole goal of the day. I'm like, I'm going to go to a coffee shop. I'm going to apply. I sat down. I was like, oh my gosh. I just started you know, you have to submit some pictures. And then he asked to submit something that was like, um, oh, I, I read it. I read it on the, on one of the previous episodes. Um, I don't know which episode I read that on, but I remember reading it. I read my, <laughs> what I submitted. Um, it was one of those things where I felt like, is this embarrassing? Like I, I had just stream of consciousness wrote it, like just came out of me and that's it. And then I started rereading it and I was like, oh, is this like, I know I'm being honest, but is this embarrassing? <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I can't, I cannot overthink this. This is my truth, whatever, submit. And when I found out I got it, I was in tears. Like I found out in the bathroom of a gas station as I was road tripping from Nashville to back to Ohio from a work event, uh, a podcasting conference. And my friend thought someone had died because I was crying so much and shaking. I couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. Um, so like 12 or 13, I think 13 total people from around the world, like around the world, <laughs> everywhere. And I was so excited. Couldn't believe it. And also just felt like, oh shit, I actually have to do this now. Very much like when I felt what I felt like when I found out I was pregnant. So excited. Oh, my God. Miracle. And then realizing, like, how it has to come out of me. <laughs> like, oh, I have to walk through this person's door. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. My quick side note here is when I actually did walk through this person's door and he opened the door so kindly and said, hello, welcome. The first thing I said to this person that I've been looking up to for so long and I was so excited 
to see him and felt so in shock was, I feel like I'm on drugs. <laughs> Which is probably like not thing you want to say to someone who doesn't know you, doesn't know that you don't actually do drugs, and you're coming into their home. So, <clears throat> yeah, didn't really play cool there. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't involve myself in a lot of places and spaces with other, other photographers because I've just found that I don't know. I just haven't, I, I oftentimes don't resonate with the way they're structured or the way people are, like, choose to relate to each other. And, but I knew, I knew, I knew this would be different because not only did I have trust in him just because of, and yeah, I don't, didn't know him at all, but there's something about his work and the way he went about his work that I just had this inherent and deep, peaceful trust in him. Um, and his heart. And I just knew that the people that would be drawn to him must have that thread in them as well. So I went the day before I was freaking out to the point of like, I had that delusional thought of like, there's no one else is is this freaked out. No one else is panicking the way I am. Like, that's really what I thought. There was a WhatsApp group chat and people were like, I'm so excited. I'm blah, blah, blah. like so sweet, so enthusiastic. And I wanted to throw up and crawl under the earth. Everything that I was putting onto my slideshow for my presentation for this, I was like, I, I'm embarrassed. I don't know. Everything, all of a sudden I hated everything. This doesn't make sense. Am I the biggest hypocrite in the world? What is going on? So I didn't really, I didn't really understand what was happening until I was there. Um, I was basically the token crier. I cried so much and I couldn't rein it in. Like, I, <clears throat> I mean, of course, like I quietly cried, like in each person's presentation, not to be a distraction, but my own presentation wasn't an exception and I could not choke back the tears. I just like, I felt so open and raw and fragile the whole time I was there. Um, but, you know, as I sat and I listened to each person's presentation and, you know, saw the work and then was able to hear a little bit of their heart and their soul and their background and context, I just... was reminded of how different it is to be in a space where being understood is the assumption. How much energy am I wasting in my life and in my work? Working from and coming from this place of like, how do I make myself clear? Who gives a fuck? Like if I, if, if I'm not understood, then I'm not understood, then it's not for you. And I think that's why this podcast has been such a sustainable practice for me, because I'm not trying to have someone understand me. Like if you're listening to this, I trust your heart. And to just hear my heart. And that's it. I don't plan these things. I don't script anything. <laughs> You're like, oh, you don't need to tell me you don't script it. <laughs> it's shit show recordings. <laughs> but, you know, I just... <clears throat> but then I think about, you know, in the work that I do and in, like, the programs that I dream up and I believe so deeply and I think I waste a lot of energy shaming myself into this <clears throat> belief that like 
if I don't find a way to articulate myself, no one will understand or get it. And um, it just won't actually help anyone because no one will even, you know, hear it or understand what it is. If, if it is something that they would like and enjoy and help them and benefit them. But what a waste of energy. Like a moth to a flame. Just in the same way I trusted that whoever was attracted to Alec in this workshop and this work would have this inherent connection with and I would trust their hearts in, in that way. That's the same way it works in other areas of life. Why am I making it different? Because there's more pressure, because I feel this, you know, I give in to this egoic need to fulfill a duty and I make it mean something that that's outside of me. That's it's it's like when I say when I'm photographing someone, for some reason I'm immune to that in that way. Like I just know that I don't have to have the professional photographer hat on. I'm a human being with other humans and I can see them if I put everything else aside and just be with them. Just be in that. I'm not trying to take good photographs. I don't need to try to make something really important. It is really important if I'm inside of it, if I'm just being with it. And um, as I sat there and although... Everyone there lives such different lives and has such different work and such different perspectives and such different backgrounds and such different experiences and opinions, I'm sure, and all of that. I felt and empathized and felt so in love with each person and what they're doing and believed in their efforts and their way of being in the world and so then when it was my turn to go up, the feeling in my body of like, oh, I'm not, there's no reason to not defend, but like, there's no justification. There's no, I'm not trying to set the stage to be understood. I'm not trying, I don't need to over explain something. I just need to talk about my work. So it's like, felt like being in my underwear. You know what I mean? It felt like there's nothing. It felt like, wow, I'm actually far more afraid of being understood than not understood. Mm hmm. Interesting. And what might happen if I remove the need to feel like I'm doing something quote unquote right or clearly or powerfully when it's outside of my photo work. I felt that although of course I am deeply connected to and with my work, with my personal family work, with every time I lift up my camera I'm photographing a client I fall in love with each person I love I see and feel this I don't even know it sounds like creepy and weird like you fall in love with everyone you take but I it's like every time I'm photographing someone regardless of how close or not I am with a person if it's a a client I haven't met before or someone that I'm just acquaintances with or someone that's a close family friend like I I feel like tears are brought to my eyes every time, like seeing them in that way. And um, so, yes, that work is so important. But what I realize is exactly that is what I feel for when I'm creating programs and witnessing artists in this other way like in the space of connection, in the space of sharing, in the space of supporting and nourishing each other. 
And I have this deep, fierce, rageful, like temperature hot. Like my, I feel like my body gets hot with like rage when I hear about these places and spaces where there's just a gross abuse of power and privilege and role um, when addressing artists. Like portfolio reviews in general, uh, I've always had a problem with. I don't like them. I don't opt for them. Uh, I don't oftentimes want to hear people's opinion of the work because it feels irrelevant in many ways until it's not, <laughs> until, you know, you're trying to get yourself in a place or space. And it would be very helpful to hear what someone with a different lens thinks. And um, But if you're not grounded in, I mean, you're never going to be immune to feeling hurt, but if you're not grounded in what it is you're doing, that's a really scary and risky and damaging position to put yourself in, I believe. Uh, I've heard horror stories that I won't even repeat that, I mean, could completely derail a person's life and make them go in a different direction in their life. Uh, and I don't know, in those moments, it feels more pressing to me to create dialogue and connection around the sustenance of this type of life, even more so than making photographs, even more. All that being said, there were one-on-ones <laughs> in during this workshop and um, with three different people. It was, of course, Alec, and then uh, he invited uh, two uh, other artists, Stacy Baker and Vince Leo. And I mean, I just knew I had to trust that they shared a uh, similar heart and intent. And so I wasn't going into it like braced for, you know, thinking it wasn't going to be a good experience, but I definitely felt very raw and vulnerable going into that because the whole experience made me feel so many things that I haven't felt before. And, um, I, when done with the proper care and with no ego and with simply purity of intent, those situations can be so powerful and they were and beautiful. And my time with each of those people will sit with me for a long time, for a very long time, forever. So there were a lot of um, pieces of um, just feedback or questions, um, conversations, and uh, that will stay with me. <laughs> and I walk away knowing that the thing, though, the thing that I need to do most from that was the thing that I felt the le the most resistance around. <laughs> And I know I had, I instantly knew I had to do it because I instantly burst out crying when he said it. <laughs> so, and it says nothing about the way he delivered it. It was from Vince and he was, um, yeah, I'm, I'll just share this one part. I don't need to disclose like all of the context or whatever around all of it. Um, cause it's so personal. I mean, not so personal, but it's just so individual. Um, but like <laughs> I had put a bunch of my photos out and we were talking, he was asking me, you know, questions around the work and like the volume. And he, he basically said to me to pick one, to sit with one photograph just sit with it for a really long time until you hear it and I just like instantly started crying because um, I know <laughs> oh you know we all know we're just searching for the right person to 
give us permission, even though we really don't want to think about it that way. We're always searching for permission to do what we want to do, to be what we want to be. And I'm very much like a fire hose type of person. Like if I find something that I love, I just, you know, hyperfixation style or even with pictures, just like, oh, it just goes into this flow state of just take the pictures. I love to take, 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 take the pictures, see, 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 and put them on an archive and visit them later when I need it. Or, um, yeah, I have this resistance to sitting with one for too long. Is that I want to look at more. I want to drink more in. And I think that there's this this fear and this uh, resistance to that level of intimacy, really. Uh, I remember years ago I was in um, a coaching container and with my coach Haley Carr and she asked me if I have something around if I struggle around intimacy and uh, because I had told her like there are times where I'll I see like the subject line of something or the first few words and I could tell it's a uh, it's words of gratitude or um, something really kind or beautiful. And I feel I like avoid it. I feel like I, I leave it unread. I don't even click into it. I have to wait until I'm in a space where I feel like I can receive it. And it just feels like a lot. And, you know, when I care about something, when I love something, when I'm trying to express it, it's it's too much. It feels like too much. I cannot even bear it. I just can't. And I know that sitting with one photograph for that long is the same thing. I know if my if I'm going to show up to my own beliefs and my practice and my philosophy is all centered around the fact that when you press that button and you're looking through your viewfinder, and you're in that moment and you say this because the, everything is right there. Everything is in that one second. Everything, just that and that and that and that and that and that. And, that. and it's everywhere. But stopping to be with that one feels like it can completely undo me. <laughs> and it's the same school of thought around what I felt like in that workshop as I'm sitting with one person and not just like clicking through and looking at work and glazing things over and but sitting and listening and hearing and seeing this one person their work just them and just like every single one of them tears every one of them I was Gosh, what an incredible human being. So what happens when you do that with yourself? I have an easier time doing that with myself when I work with my photos like my cell phone photos of uh in nostalgia now in sacred seeing like the at the end of the month the templates where i give prompts and then you think of the prompt and you look through your photos and you work with your photos in that way and it helped you really like dig into the self-inquiry and exploration and exploring your relationship with yourself and your photographs and your life and um I find that I can give myself so much more grace about, you know, my motherhood and my, what I'm doing in my life. But to look at the photographs that I take in that 
way under that context of like listening to them without intent of being the conductor of like making something oof it feels so scary and you know why <laughs> i'm going to tell you why because it almost feels like if I sat with my photos long enough, I would inevitably be confronted with having to surrender to loving myself. Pick a photograph that you've taken and just sit with it and stare at it for an uncomfortable amount of time. Long enough to where the initial judgments and glazings melt away and it's just redundant and boring to care about the superficial things of like the way someone looks or you look or how well, quote unquote, it's done or not done. Or... And start like piercing through that veil and going through those layers. It's like the why seven times thing. Like why, for what purpose, for what purpose, for what purpose. I do this, um, I do a process like that in my NLP coaching and it can feel so frustrating and annoying to be but, but why but for what purpose and why but why for what purpose why and you just keep going 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 until you get to like that roadblock like wait I don't know that there's anything beyond that and then there's usually one or two layers beyond that <laughs> and then once you kind of unlock that, there's just no one see, unseeing that. And that is the power of this medium, the power of coaching, like self-discovery, lenses it's like it's not that we always have to focus on us and what's going on with us it's, I feel like there's a lot of benefit in focusing more on the external world and then going internal when you start feeling ungrounded or whatever it is but once you can understand what's driving the results you're getting in your life, the experiences you're getting in your life, the actions you're taking in your life. You don't even have to do it. Like you just see it. And then it either becomes super energizing or super deflating in a good way of like it loses its power if it's something that's not resourceful for you. 
<laughs> when I did when I did wine, I ended up with the word love, and I was so I was like rejecting it. I'm like, what? What is that for love? <laughs> I can't. I can't be like, no, no. I mean, that's beautiful, but like, no, there's something, you know, it's got to be, no, it's something else. <laughs> but like, I sat there and I got so welled up in front of every single person um, that I met and like just thinking about them, just thinking about each one of those people, I could cry and it's, why like it, it's love you know you're doing this you're doing what you're doing for love like even if you're doing something that you don't want to be doing right now you're probably doing it for love just the vehicle or the path feels mutated and annoying for you and it's because of all the fears or the secondary gains of you know whatever situation you're in I know I'm meandering I'm getting off topic but like I don't know I don't know. I need to press pause here. I don't know. Okay, I took a brief pause. I <laughs> drank some, some more coffee because caffeination is obviously the answer to this. Um, and I'm not even going to try to um, bridge and, <laughs> and, and flow into something coherent from from that last piece i'm just gonna let that linger because that's what feels right and but now moving on um so okay i'm there uh have you know one-on-ones have you know group discussion oh just deliciously immersed in the discussion on projects and, you know, creating work and being with, you know, making things of them and making books and this and that. And um, hearing about his new project, uh, Alex's new project, and asking him questions about projects that I've followed for years and all this stuff. And... Back along the thread of we always know, it's like the same exact thing that I fell in love with him for and his work. And it was this possibility of a way of being and living in this, in this way, in that work, in this way. And One of the most important things that I took away from being with him in this space, of course, it was so valuable to hear someone speak so earnestly and transparently about process and, you know, behind the scenes stuff. And that context is always really wonderful and just sobering and, um, demystifying and it really helps clear this ambiguous fog of you know the fine art world or you know whatever but my one of my favorite parts of being with him is watching him talk about work his work the work of others like it was real really weird it's like I was loving what he was saying and listening to what he was saying specifically, but there's this major part of me that was kind of like, felt like I kept getting up out of my seat of consciousness and sitting in a different direction, looking at him in a different direction of like, not in a different way, but like I'm hearing the information he's saying, but the information that he's saying is almost irrelevant, just drinking in what it looks like to see someone in their life in the way he's in his life and 
and sharing so honestly and openly about the work and how he went about the work and changing directions in his work and going back in another direction that he didn't foresee doing and just well all of it and so i leave that workshop refreshed and re-energized for getting back to that it didn't leave me but i also have really let a lot of the pressures and um, the noise constrict me and drain me, really energy-wise drain me from just actioning more on the things that I want to do. So now I wonder, what is possible? What will I have energy for? When I come into it with almost like a mantra, if I use this mantra of like, I am understood, I have sat with this and allowed myself to listen to what it has to say to me and love because love. What is possible if that's the jumping off point? What gets made? What gets created? And how do you feel as you're doing it? If those are your inherent assumptions, those are your jumping off point, not the place you're trying to land. What if instead of doing work in the hopes of landing in the space of now I'm understood, or my work, it will speak to me and I will hear it when it's good enough to be heard. Or now I achieve love. Now I can love it. Now I can love myself because this thing is made. And what if you start there? You're already understood. You've already sat and listened to what the work is telling you that it wants to be, that it wants to do, that it wants to emit, whatever, and love is already abundantly present. Love. You, you've even just come to the starting line because of love. <laughs> What's wrong with me in my old age? <laughs> Just falling apart. I'm crying all the time. <laughs> it's so ridiculous and stupid, but I won't apologize anymore. It's because I fucking care, and I'm not too cool to care. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Okay. And with that said, I do, I want to touch on something that I thought was so important that happened to me the other day. Well, actually this morning I was, I was boxing with a client, a one-on-one -on -one client of mine that I love so, so much. And, um, I was sharing with this person about my, you know, how recently I've made some, um, big moves in terms of debts and pulling from savings that I didn't want to pull from and, you know, doing all this and making actual moves, like, like actually doing it instead of in my mind being like, okay, just come from this place of non-attachment, release um, the need to feel pressure, bringing in income and no, actually setting up my life so that that is the actual reality being lived versus trying to make myself live from the reality when the reality isn't so. <laughs> it's not matched with it. Um, and for, for us, for me, this looks like, you know, working, like moving things around and curating things so that we can fully live off of my partner's salary versus very much not that. And I feel myself lightening up, like 
loosening up, lightening up. I feel myself moving more freely and acting more on the things I want to do. And I, I do believe it's because the energy has moved. And with that, I have opened up a space of responding a little bit differently. And there was this last minute fishing trip that was that Ben or my partner was invited to, and he was able to take our son, our five-year-old. And it was like a big deal thing because I guess this chartered experience was meant to be for a client that um, last minute couldn't do it. So he was getting the ticket for free. And it's usually something that's like really expensive. And, blah, 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 blah. and I was full of all of these reasons, very good reasons, might I add, of why this wasn't a good idea. <laughs> I mean, it was like a six hour boating trip. They were leaving at 530 in the morning from port. So he, he had to get up. They had to get up at like 345 in the morning and drive an hour and a half to the port and like six hours. The kid, he's been so whiny lately. Like we went to an arts festival and he was just like whining, whining. Uh, and we're mobile and walking and doing things. I'm like stuck on a boat. He's the only kid. Six hours fishing. He's never done something like this. There was just all of these reasons why I'm like, I don't know if this is a good idea, but I could just sense the enthusiasm from my partner. And I'm like, I don't want to take away this father son experience. So I'm just going to let it be. And even in the morning, I was feeling extra like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? This. He woke up. He was like deliriously tired. I had to like put him in a bunch of blankets because it was in the middle of the night. So it was chilly. And I, I, I unhooked the, we have like a backpack that has like a little leash thing um, for a three-year-old to wear. And I unhooked the leash part. And I'm like, okay, I want you to hook this on to his life jacket and make sure he's never out of your sight. And boy, anyway, long story long, uh, they went on this boat trip and apparently it was, it was incredible. But Cash threw up like three, four times. He had puke coming out of his nose. And my kids don't. Like my kids are not pukers. They weren't even spitter uppers when they were newborns. Like nothing. So I just felt like that must have been so traumatic for him. But even so, my partner said he was like, do you want a break? Do you want to take a break, buddy? And he goes, I got next fish. As he's got like puke coming out of his nose. <laughs> and they caught a bunch of fish and he just rallied. And it was a crazy and amazing. And my partner said he'd like remember it forever. It was like a forever memory type of day. And I like went up to him and I held his shoulders and I was like, get ready. You ready? I was wrong. You were right. And he almost fell over. Because <laughs> I'm always right. <laughs> but um, no, in in all seriousness, I... It was a really... I shared it because it was a really profound... Lesson lived. You know, it's like we, we all know rationally that despite our best laid efforts and um, intentions and learnings and experiences and calibrating and functioning in the world, like in a logical way, that even doing that, we don't know best always. We just don't. But to feel the apprehension in my body, feel that trepidation, feel that hesitance and go on and let him do that. And then have them come back and see the joy, the deep joy and the bonding and the experience that came of that, even though it wasn't all quote unquote good, like there was throw up and he wasn't feeling good, but he still loved it. It was like the bottom of the list of what went wrong for him. And like, um, it actually made it even better, you know, um, and having, if I were to 
to have vetoed that experience, they wouldn't have that. And those are like, those are the things that make life worth living. And I could have never known if you would have told me outside of the emotional impact of that trip. Uh, yeah, he ended up throwing up three times and blah, 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 blah. I would have been like, see, this is why he didn't go. Like, no. But it's funny because those things that happened that would have been the reasons why I didn't want him to go were irrelevant and insignificant when you look at the big picture of what that experience gave them. So it's just a slice of humble pie, you know? It's like what is available when you stop trying to protect everyone around you and yourself and be the one with all the answers and be the one that's making the most of their time and making the most of their work. What happens when you let all that go and you just let yourself be in love and open and listening more than you're trying to speak? And know that you're understood. And even if you're not cognitively understood, you are felt. And understood in a way that words don't even matter anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that is what I have for you today. I feel so deeply blessed and fortunate to have gone through that experience um, and shared space with just such beautiful human beings. And um, yeah, I'm sure I'll be unpacking that for a, a long time. I would love for you to take some of the prompts that I opened up hear some of the questions um and really like sit with them i'm the number one offender of being like that's that's such a good idea and then not or just be like oh that question such a good question and then like not actually <laughs> answering it just being like oh yeah good point okay so i don't even remember everything that i prompted but uh I'll go through the show notes or I'll go through the um, captions or whatever transcription and then put it in the show notes so that you can refer back to it. I hope that you're having a beautiful week. And um, if you are wanting to connect more, if this opened up something in you, um, and you want to talk more about it, feel free to send me a DM on Instagram. It's Bianca Leah Mora. Uh, that'll be in the show notes. Um, I'm also open for remote photography booking from anywhere in the world. And I, which uh, at this point in time is a completely pay what you want, pay what you can, whatever price point. Um, because I am just so enthusiastic and open to the experience that I don't want a silly thing like money to be a barrier. Um, I also, uh, if you are local, I have my books open for in-person sessions. I am in the Cleveland area. And the other way to connect with me would be uh, over Zoom. I offer coaching and um, programs around connecting to your craft and being with each other in a space much like the space that you are listening to now. So that's it. Any information you could want will be in the show notes and I look forward to catching you next time. This has been an Awkward Sage production. 